Hi, I'm Holly Idle. I'm the exhibitions director here at the Dairy Barn Art Center. Today we're speaking with three artists featured in OH plus five contemporary art of our region. The exhibition is on view now through March 13th, 2022, and you can find more information at dairybarn.org. Um, now, please introduce yourselves. Brooke, could you start? Yeah, uh, my name is Brooke Ripley. I'm currently in the MFA program at Ohio University in painting and drawing. And I got my undergrad at the Columbus College of Art and Design. Thanks. Hi, Michaela, could you introduce yourself? Hi, I'm Michaela Woods. Um, I just graduated from Ohio University um, in, I created my own major in fine arts, photography and design. Um, and so that's a little bit about me. Yeah. Cool. Hey, Luke. Uh, my name is Luke Sheets. I'm professor of uh, 3D art at Ohio Northern University. And I uh, did my graduate studies at Bowling Green. Great. Well, thanks for being here today. So the three of you are going to um, be in conversation. I'm actually going to step out of the conversation. Um, and you're welcome to talk about your artwork that's specifically in the show or the whole body of work, whichever, um, however this conversation leads. So have fun, enjoy. I hope it leads to a nice conversation. Thank you. Okay, so well, I'll just take these questions in order. Um, what processes were used in the making of the art work in the Ohio Plus Five 22 show? Uh, Michaela, you're up on my screen right now, so. <laughs> okay, um, so my art that was on display, I would start it out as an assignment for my class, my photography class. And um, the title of the assignment was accessories. And so I ran with it. Everybody else in my class kind of just did like a belt and photographed a belt, somebody wearing a belt. But I ran with it and decided to make it like a full art expression. And I created a jewelry headpiece that I spent a week working on and perfected and um, got a really well done piece that I had never made before. So it was a test for myself and my talent and um, created a mood board for how I wanted to visualize it. Um, went out to the thrift store and I got a large tapestry that was gonna be the backdrop. And I decided that it was best to have a male um, a black man uh, model the headpiece to give the contrast of like the femininity within the piece itself, but having masculine energy exude it. And so it just makes it uh, like a welcoming piece that goes beyond any kind of constraint. And um, the purpose of it, when I put it, I picked, found the model was my friend Savian and he's already fashionable in style, like has the top tier accessories. And so added onto his ex personal expression, made it so much better. And when he, when I put it on his head, he just looked like a king. He looked very regal. And so that's how I wanted to, when I had him model, I said, you know, this is like your crowning moment. Think of this as like your portrait, you're the king of whatever land. And <laughs> this is somebody painting you as your portrait. So pose in that way where you're strong and you're sturdy and you are held up so high that nothing can touch you when you have this on. And he perfected that in how he modeled and it was shot so that you could feel that as well with the colors that I used in the photograph. And it was just, that that was just one of my proudest moments was getting that done and really executing it perfectly to how I matched the mood board and he understood exactly what I was trying to get at. And so working creatively with someone like that would definitely helped in creating this image. I remember um, that piece in the show and I could feel the strength exuded from it and the juxtaposition of something traditionally feminine with his masculine energy. It was it was a really powerful piece, I do remember it. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, I got a glimpse of it. I was able to 
look at the uh, the virtual walkthrough that they have posted online. And yeah, I was trying to catch your works, you know, throughout the show just to see you know, what other work was being or the other artists that I was grouped with. So yeah, no, it was a really striking photo. Thank you. So uh, Brooke, same question. Yeah, so this piece at the time, I was really focused on memory and theories of consciousness. Um, and the work was created, I first drew the image from colored pencil or with colored pencil. And I was looking at a reference image from actually pre-pandemic. <laughs> it was actually a very emotional piece because it was my fine arts cohort. Um, and so once I drew the imagery, I obscured the entire thing with soy wax and then delicately carved away at it with ceramic carving tools to reveal the sketch. Um, so the process, it was really hands on and include like rubbing pigment into the wax with my hands and even physically marring the surface because since it's soy wax, which has a low melting point, the warmth of your hand can even mar it. And I was hoping that would or it, the intention of that is so it would support my concept of the degradation of memory. And it was just a very personal and loving process creating this piece. It was like creating, like paying homage to the people that I love and that I um, couldn't see once we went online. <laughs> yeah. Um, so yeah, my work is uh, a slip cast assemblage. I've been using commercial molds that I collect from various hobbyists that get out of the business or just uh, are liquidating what they have in stock. And I've been using those as building blocks. So these kind of ready-made icons and symbolism, and then I juxtapose them, cut them up, put them together, rework them, uh, and blend those with some of my own mold making uh, from my teaching. So the Ship of Fools piece is, is one of those where I think I have, oh, four or five commercial molds and then multiples of, uh, what is it? it would be like a drawing skeleton you know, a skeleton for a still life that I, I stole a couple bones and, and used that to create a, a two piece mold. Um, and then just building up layers of glaze and firing on the surface to, to get that kind of age and weathered look, so. Wow. Um, I think we kind of, both of you have kind of touched on the significance of the title mm -hmm. with, you know, the king and uh, da, 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 how were the, we to know? Um, yeah, Ship of Fools, you know, again, it was just kind of reaction to early pandemic. You know, I don't know if either of you saw the piece or familiar with it, but it's got this, it's basically a garden gnome riding on a ship that's run up shore on. Oh, I do remember bones. seeing that, yeah. yes. So there's like a, a fighting rooster, fighting cock on top and an eagle and all these other kind of icons around there. And the guy's just sitting there playing a flute, so. I think that's, that definitely kind of gives <laughs> um, something to the pandemic, a different aspect of how like, we're just kind of sailing through right now right. <laughs> and we're everyone's just trying to get by and entertain themselves at the same time it's like ooh, what a time to be alive i guess yeah. <laughs> something like a universal chaos like we're exactly. all just in it together <laughs> so. yeah is there anything that either of you want to add to that i mean like i said you both kind of touched on it in the, the first go around um you can go um i didn't i don't really have much more to say about the title it just more came from um the actual experience of photographing and working with savian uh 
I had no idea of what I would name it before I was even asked <laughs> what to title this piece. Because normally when I do title my work, I do it by the name of whoever's modeling because a piece of who or whatever I'm photographing is shown in that image. And so they become the image itself, regardless of um, the idea behind it. And so I tried to, for myself, at least it was more of a dig deeper into what are you actually looking at? And so that was really the significance of creating the title King. Uh, for my piece, um, the only thing I wanna add is it kind of earned its name before it was ever created, which was kind of weird because my professor before we went online had suggested, cause I was working with memory that I take a one second clip video every single day to help catalog the days and kind of remember it a little bit better. And there's a whole podcast and memory and the passage of time that kind of explained the reasoning for it. Um, so I was doing that and it just seemed very serendipitous that just a month before everything went online, she had tasked me with doing that. And so I was able to catch the very last day that I was with my cohort. So I remember watching that video just a couple months later and thinking I had no idea, we didn't know. Um, so I earned its title uh, long before it was created, like a year prior. <laughs> That's not kind of an interesting full circle moment. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was a very emotional piece. <laughs> yeah. Generally when I'm working, I'm focused on just arranging these items and then the kind of the title works itself out or I find, you know, I look back and I see some relevance to whatever was happening at the time. Uh, sometimes I do go into it with an idea in mind and I, I can't remember for sure with that piece if I had or not, but uh, yeah, I, I, I tend to kind of look back after the piece is done and decide on a, the name of it or however I wanna present that, so. Yeah, there's a lot of like subconscious things that go into it and you don't recognize it until you're done. Mm. Yeah, or asked about it. <laughs> that, yeah, that's usually the biggest uh, inspiration for me to name my pieces, actually filling in that line when I submit it somewhere. Yeah. Uh, um, so the next question is whether or not the piece was created as part of a larger series? Um, mine turned out to be, yes. Uh, again, with more of a push from assignments because I was in school during the time that I created this. My final project was a uh, six picture series that had one thing that was cohesive that tied everything together. And it could be like the aesthetic or something physical within the image that worked all the way around. And I did not use the image King, but from the images I took of Savian within with the headpiece on, I used one of his images in the six picture series um, to show five different ways you could wear one headpiece. And so I expanded on the headpiece and I created it to make, to be worn as a shirt, a garter belt, a skirt, um, and a floor length headpiece. And so for each different model, I adjusted it to how their body type worked and styled them to how it was going to be worn. And so the series is, pretty amazing altogether. And the constant theme of regality and strength, beauty and femininity all work throughout the pieces. And his really tied it together because he was the sole male that I photographed, which I wish I had gotten a second one, but it makes it even better that he is, is a standout, standalone piece, having the original uh, start of it and then growing into the rest of the five other images. So there is more if you want to see the other ones. 
I will definitely be stalking your artist website later. Uh, <laughs> Great. <laughs> Um, so my piece, it was a part of a series um, because it was that point of time where I was obsessed with memory. And um, so each piece in that series kind of hit memory from a different angle or it was focused on a different type of memory. So this piece was memory in terms of loss and then that degradation of uh, my idea of who these people were and how I had come to know them. But there's another piece that's actually a memory that isn't even my own. So it's of my mother um, and kind of just an imposed memory, right? She told me about this instance and I was deciding how I felt about that and like what I remember about it, even though I was never there. So that constructed memory I was really, really into like the failability and inaccuracies of memory and how that determines who we are. So that ended up being my thesis show um, in my undergrad. So I think there's about 15 pieces in total that hit wow. memory from different angles. What about you, Luke? Um, yeah, I mean, it's it's hard to draw the line with some of these bodies of work. Um, the, it's all kind of growing out of a, a group of work that I called Icons of the Faith. And again, it was really early juxtaposition of these um, slip cast forms. Uh, and they just kind of evolved over time. And I don't know if this one, you know, Ship of Fools is kind of leaving that and going into a more pandemic themed body of work but it's it's certainly on a, on this kind of continuum you know I'm, I'm looking in my screen and i've got a couple of these other forms on the shelves behind me i could bring them a little closer if you'd like yeah yeah so this is a part of an early piece that broke. Um, I created these uh, little traveling altars with a couple of these that fold up kind of reliquary style. And this was really the, the impetus for the uh, icons of the faith title. Um, and then of course, you know, I had a series of these that uh, were, uh, they're actually like number one were number one football slip cast things that I, I altered uh, for this. And then I had a piece with two of these facing each other, one done up in red, one done up in blue, um, traditional ceramic floral patterns. And it was like Midwest political discourse back you know, late 20 teens, but that first piece is really awesome. How how long did it take you to finish this? Um, it's hard to say. I mean, the the the, the process is pretty kind of intense work for a while, and then you wait, and then some more intense work where you know I'm filling the molds, getting them out of the molds, and then cleaning them and assembling them and firing. Um, and then the, this is actually a, a, a wonderful bronze glaze that I use a lot on my sculptural pieces. Um, and then it's just, you know, creating enough pieces that I can then assemble them. So the, I did a couple versions of that where there were two, uh, the, the praying hands with the revolver that both open up you know, they, they close up and it's a box and then you open it up and there's the two of them kind of a, an altarpiece reliquary kind of thing, but. That's really cool. So, uh, and then I guess my final question then is where do you find inspiration? Uh, well, for me, I find inspiration through um, different artists that I follow on Instagram or I get pick up different subscriptions from magazines like Harper's Bazaar or Essence and just skimming through there for at least my current inspiration, that's where I get it from. But um, as you can see in <laughs> behind me, I have a lot of artwork from around the world in my house. My 
family loves to travel and my dad grew up traveling and my parents did some before they had me and <laughs> my siblings. And so a lot I would say for myself, a lot of my inspiration comes from the art that I've been exposed to growing up. And um, I'm constantly, well, not necessarily constantly because of the pandemic, but um, I usually am at like an art gallery or museum. Those are the places that I like to go to. And just taking in that kind of work is where I gain inspiration from and looking up different past photographers and studying them as well. So then I can kind of create my niche and see what works and what doesn't, and how I can, you know, be the next name like Richard, Richard Avedon or something. So that's, uh, that's how I gain my inspirations from physical art and to down to actual f photography or anything really. It's really nice to be. Oh, sorry. <laughs> um, it's really nice to kind of stay current and like through Instagram and galleries, like you were saying, and looking at other artists because it's like, you know, you're talking about an idea and you're like, oh, I can't find any other artists that are doing this, or just like hasn't happened yet that I've come across or stuff, and then someone has it at a gallery, and you're like, right. oh my goodness, and it just kind of fits together, and then it also ensures that you're staying current. Um, in the discourse of that concept which is really nice yeah, so I agree I'm, I'm kind of the same and then I also like reading really does it for me yes so <laughs> I've been reading I have four different books on theories and practices of the Anthropocene um, <laughs> and then I've also been reading Timothy Morton's book on dark ecology and it's it's really fun there's also this book called Vampire Theorists uh, Infernalis, which is speculative fiction. And it's about the squid that actually exists, but it lives so deep underwater um, that it can't exist in our environment. And every time we've kind of taken it out and tried to study it, it actually ends up like eating its own arms. Uh, really weird stuff, but I'm trying to get into speculative fiction with my art. So it's kind of a good way for me to see how they're taking like actual scientific facts and showing how those facts can be reinterpreted and kind of expose um, the faults in the way that we approach our scientific methods, which is really, really interesting. So that's what gets me excited. Oh, <laughs> uh, yeah, I, oh, I miss traveling. I really, really miss traveling. I was actually in Guatemala when everything started shutting down with a group of students. Um, but hopefully, um, leading a group to the Czech Republic this summer with my wife. So hopefully that'll get the travel fix in. But yeah, I mean, I draw from a lot of different things, you know, natural landscape, museums. Um, I'm really love anthropological, uh, historic natural history museums. You know, that's, that's where I really like to, to dig in. Uh, but then just the process itself of working with uh, clay and, and ceramics, it's very technically bound. And I, I find a lot of inspiration in just working within those confines, seeing what I can do with the chemistry, seeing what I can do at different temperatures as well, so. I'm sure that's a matter of a lot of like aha moments when you like discover you can yeah. push it a little bit further in one regard. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, crazy, you know, not crazy things, but just random things that are said to me, you know, and at, at one point and then a couple years later, something else happens and I connect the two mm -hmm. and I'm able to, to move forward with that. So. Yeah, because I, I was also going to add, I, from hearing you talk, Luke, I <laughs> remembered um, another vital part of my inspiration are the people around me and the experiences that they go through, like conversations or just like seeing different people and trying to expose what's really inside of them through that artwork is one of the greater inspirations that I have is just that sole aspect of trying to pull something out of someone and 
making it so that they can see either themselves in whatever I just shot of them or um, see, have someone look in and see something that they wouldn't have thought about before be they even laid eyes on whatever they're looking at. So that's definitely a big inspiration is how to inspire others. Um, so I guess it's my turn now to ask some questions. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Luke, we could start with you since you were, you were the third person to go on these rounds. Okay. What are you currently creating? Oh, my work cycle ebbs and flows with whatever classes I'm teaching. So last semester I had a sculpture class with the that was focusing on the slip casting. So I, at this point, I'm kind of refiring and, and tweaking several assemblages from that set. And I'm currently doing uh, two beginner uh, ceramic classes. So I'm, I'm doing a lot of wheel throwing as you know, demonstrating for them, so. Cool. Brooke, what about you? Uh, yeah, so I took a weird turn from memory and I went straight into environmentalism and I'm now working uh, from a mid-apocalyptic climate crisis future. That's the perspective I'm going for for the viewer to look at. <laughs> so it's pretty dystopian um, and I'm using like just glimpses into the familiar domestic scenes that we have. So I have one piece I just made. It's actually in um, the Siegfried uh, Arts Gallery at Ohio University right now. Um, but it's a fridge piece where there's a woman leaning over a fridge door and she's just grabbing something out of the, the door of it. And it's just a water bottle. But if you look on the water bottle, it has these little toxic symbols with the water inside of it just to imply that there's some sort of issue with the water quality, or maybe it's not really water, who's to say. And so just really small ways for me to kind of get the viewer to ask some questions about how this person or subject is in this situation. So it's been really fun. The last one got a lot angrier and I was chucking a uh, crumpled up fabric at the painting. So it was pretty great. <laughs> it was kind of therapeutic. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> um, I am currently working on a different headpiece, more of a commission piece than a personal deciding to make it. Um, but that's what I'm really working on. And I have generated some ideas because I moved back home to DC. And so being back home creates more in different in type of inspiration than being at school and in Athens. And so I have laid out some different ideas for photo shoots that I haven't yet to execute, but my main focus right now is working on the headpiece. Um, okay, so my second question is, what do you think is evoked in the viewer when they see your artwork? And how do you hope it's evoked? Yeah, I mean, that's a hard question for me. Um, I don't know exactly how people are going to react to my work. You know, I get little snippets when I'm working in the studio because I, I tend to work next to my students. So I, I was able to catch a lot of side eye and concerned looks between people when I was assembling these. Um, but I think what I really want to uh, evoke in the viewer is this kind of curiosity, uh, create a piece that reveals itself uh, in layers. The more they spend with it, the closer they get. Uh, the more they investigate, the more they should be able to get out of the piece. I like it. More in-depth thinking. <laughs> I think with my work, this goes with both both the memory work and then my newer body of work. I want the viewer to be able to empathize in either a way where they can bring their own personal experiences to the table or they can really feel what the subjects are experiencing. And in doing so, I hope that it gets them to ask questions. You know, I just want people to take a second 
and reflect on their own experiences in life. Like with my um, newer work, it's about, it's not just about the environmental climate crisis. It's also the fact that these issues that will happen in the future are also happening now. And we also have these issues happening a hundred years ago. Um, one of my newer pieces uh, I used Van Gogh's potato eaters as an inspiration for it because he's talking about a problem that still exists now and is just going to get worse in the future. Right. So I guess if we keep reiterating things and try to bring that human perspective in and really, really get our viewer to empathize, maybe that's where change starts. I like that. I, <laughs> I, I definitely see the empathetic aspect to it because I semi answered this question when I was explaining my inspiration, but um, my version of empathy would be more for a self and um, seeing that from the person that is modeling whatever is being photographed or um, that person themselves empathizing with whatever I'm trying to bring out them. I give them direction and narration so that they can feel something and um, so that it's shown within the final image and whoever's viewing it, it goes beyond just, it's somebody in a hat, but like what's underneath this, what's going on here and why does this person make me feel like confident just by looking at the image? Um, and that's kind of what I strive to do. And hopefully and from the commentary here just like it's been it's it has worked just with my photograph of king of feeling that regality and strength within the image um so what problems did you solve when creating this artwork um yeah i think for these assemblages, the biggest problem is that kind of um, the structural changes that happen with clay throughout the process. Um, depending on how the piece is formed, it may need to have a, a, it may need to be built on a separate piece of clay so that everything shrinks and moves together, uh, both drying and in the firing. Uh, I think one of the biggest challenges with the piece in the show was just getting the surface right. I think I ended up firing, glazing and firing it again like three or four times just to arrive at that, that finish that, that we see on the piece. So. Yeah, in my experience when I've done clay, obviously not to the extent that you have at all but I always feel like the firing process is absolutely terrifying because that's the moment where you realize you've done something wrong is afterwards and you can't take it back mm -hmm. <laughs> so I, I can see that um with my piece the main issue is when you pour wax on something if it's above like a centimeter in thickness you can't see underneath it it's completely opaque even though when it's hot it's translucent so to track down my drawing from underneath, I would take a heat gun and I would hold it at the surface so that way I could see where the drawing was and then I would let it cool and I just kind of remember where it was and I'd have to go chasing for it. So it was a lot of melting, hardening, hardening, remelting, going back and forth, trying to get the correct lines in there. Um, and it, it felt like a way to also reconstruct my memory that was being lost. So the process certainly felt fitting. <laughs> um, I kind of agree with the construction of my headpiece at least was one of, and wouldn't necessarily say an issue, but uh, it was kind of a problem with create trying to find the right materials. And thankfully I found the beads and things shop on Schaefer, North Schaefer Street in Athens and they had everything that I needed and the owners are, were very welcoming. And actually I went back and showed them the final piece and they were so in awe. <laughs> but um, it was my first time creating something like that. I dabble in 
jewelry making and uh, making rings and necklaces and things like that. But the headpiece was a great expansion of that. I wasn't really sure how do I measure a head? What am I doing? So <laughs> that was that was a challenge. It's always fun and challenging to learn a new skill. Yes. Um, so I think we're going to go ahead and move into the quickfire questions. So I'm just going to read them all off, I guess, is how we are doing this. Yeah. Okay. So the questions are Claire paint, gallery or museum, morning studio time or morning hike, sketching on paper or sketching digitally, traditional medium or alternative materials, sun or moon, and music or podcast and Michaela you can go first um I would say clay I would visit a gallery I would prefer a morning hike turning into studio time <laughs> I would definitely sketch on paper I am not a digital girl <laughs> um traditional materials I guess and Sun, definitely the sun. And I would choose music over a podcast. So I would have to say uh, clay, museum, studio time, sketch on paper, uh, traditional materials, probably moon, and uh, music as well. Yeah, I would have to say, obviously, paint. I'm a little biased, but I am a painter. Um, and then a gallery. And I'd like to say it'd be a morning hike, but realistically, it's morning studio time and then paper. <laughs> um, and I think that traditional materials and alternative materials actually work really well together. I like doing like a push and pull type thing. <laughs> um, and then moon and actually podcasts, because that's also where I get my inspiration. <laughs> Very cool. That sun or moon question is a hard one. <laughs> oh, I'm like, they're both great. Okay, do we have to choose? <laughs> moon gives the pull and the sun is the push, you know. <laughs> well, that was a really great conversation to listen into. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, well, again, these are three artists that are featured in Ohio plus five contemporary art of our region here at the Dairy Barn Art Center through March 13th, 2022. You can find more information at dairybarn.org. Thanks for joining us. Bye. Thank you. Thank you.